It's the week of March 27th, 2017, and you are listening to the Pioneer Growing Point Agronomy Podcast. Today we discuss corn on sod production. I'm your co-host, DuPont Pioneer Field Agronomist Brian Buck. With me is DuPont Pioneer Field Agronomist Josh Schaffner. This is episode 5 of 2017. Welcome back, listeners. Well, Brian, today's topic is coming from one of our listeners uh, from at Tessing Aaron via Twitter. And as you said in the show, he wants to hear some strategies for corn going on sod acres, uh, specifically around nitrogen, best trait packages, and a chemical plan. And uh, certainly that's a great question, and thanks for submitting that to us, Brian. Uh, maybe not going to cover them in the order he asked there, but I think anytime we look at corn on sod acres, uh, we want to take a look at the weed control package first. Yeah, weed control, one of the best return on investments you can get. Uh, having clean fields do lead to higher bushels. And uh, so something different about corn on sod production from your typical corn on bean or corn on corn rotation. A lot of times coming out of sod, you're going to fight a couple different things maybe than you normally would. Uh, one of the biggest things I think is dandelions we need to control. Uh, a lot of times you do get dandelions as, you know, stands of alfalfa or sod fields do get older. And also you tend to get some other grasses, maybe quack grass or some other things that come in. So, uh, Josh, when I look at it, I think first things first for me, if you know you're going to rotate out of it and you have the opportunity, taking care of it in the fall and killing the field in the fall, I think is the best uh, setup going into the next year. No, I think you're right on there, Brian. And obviously when we look at corn on sod acres, it's a lot different management strategy than say our corn on corn or corn on soybean acres, mainly because we got to worry about perennials. In most cases, when we're looking at, you know, our non corn on sod acres, we're more worried about annual weed pressure, but with alfalfa, you know, number one, alfalfa, the crop being a perennial, we got to control that. And then some of the things like the winter annuals, the dandelions, and then obviously grasses like quack grass being a perennial again, if we don't get those under control in the fall, they can be a major challenge in the spring. Right. And so you think about that and you think about, you know, classic mixes we'd use. I know one thing both of us have used a lot in the fall is, you know, a mix of 2,4-D, you know, glyphosate, and then like a crop oil concentrate just to heat up the mix a little bit more. Um, Tends to do a really good job. The 2,4-D does a great job on the dandelions and the the glyphosate will clean up the grasses that are out there. Yeah. I mean, my favorite mix when I was kind of writing recommendations for those situations was, you know, a quart of glyphosate, a pint and a half of 2,4-D with some crop oil. And in most cases, you get that time before you get to a dormancy issue in the fall. And come spring, you're going to have a pretty nice uh, seed bed and, and basically a nice clean field to work with from the get-go. Right. So, Josh, you think about it, we're talking about fall applications, which, you know, it's a little late for that now, right? We're uh, getting towards the end of March and, you know, fields are maybe starting to just starting to green up right now and they will be here in the coming weeks. So what do we do if we have a corn on sod field we want to do that had nothing done to it so far? Uh, what would the chem program, you know, for this year be if you had that? Yeah, if, if the flexibility is there, my first choice is going to be the same thing. I take a look at... You know, we get into middle of April here, or as soon as we warm up, I just look for that first nice stretch of weather. And I'd actually go out there with the same mix of glyphosate, 2,4-D, and crop oil. Uh, try to burn it down. Give it a, you know, 7 to 10, 12 days if you can to kind of burn off and mellow out. And then uh, make your tillage pass and plant into that. That's my first choice. And, and I agree with that 100%. So if you can get out there and kill that really early and, you know, mitigate those plants... If the alfalfa gets going and you have some dandelions out there and some other things, you try to go out and, for example, work the ground before you plant, it gets super lumpy and it's really hard to get good soil to seed contact and stay consistent with depth and everything else. So uh, either way, I think that same mix works great. But like you said, you got to get out there early, and then we'll come back and plant you know, a week or two later, yeah. uh, depending on what you put out. Yep. And I'd say that's the most common mistake when we look at fields that don't get burned down in the fall. A lot of growers get nervous that I just got to get it worked up and planted. But when all that's said and done, they, they do that, they deal with a poor seed bed, and then usually come early May, it's green enough fast, and you're fighting the quack grass, the alfalfa, and the dandelions. And the one thing we learned, Brian, with those winter annuals, when you get those dandelions and shepherd purse and white cockle, if they get anywhere near a flower phase in season, there's just nothing you can do to control them. Right, and they are winter annuals, so they, they're off to a head start usually when the spring starts. So get taking care of them early. You know, Josh, one thing. When it comes to residual products, if you are doing that mix where you get the good burn down early, um, a lot of times you're not going to have a lot come back very quick. So a lot of times it might be, you know, that burn down program early and then coming back with, a, you know, some kind of dicamba product roundup, maybe, a, you know, some other grass product in there for residual. But in general, it's mostly burn down, burn down uh, for me, I guess, in the past with, with a corn on sod situation. Yeah, and then maybe just a little bit of residual. I, I might put a little bit of acetochlor in there just to help some late flushes of annual grass. But in most cases, you know, it's it was usually a two-pass system, either a fall burn down, spring burn down, kind of followed by an early post to catch anything greening up away for your little residual down. 
and uh, you're off and running from a weed control standpoint. Yeah, that is a great point. If you do get the the fall kill done, it tends to the regular programs you'd probably use corn on beans, corn on corn do tend to work quite a bit better. Yep, absolutely. Uh, Brian, kind of moving into segment two of that question around nutrient management, uh, corn following alfalfa acres. And, and nitrogen is probably the biggest thing, and we'll talk about that. But when I think of corn on sod, the first thing I think about is there's probably a lot of removal of nutrients, specifically potash, leading up to that corn. Yeah, alfalfa is a monster consumer of potassium. So uh, we were talking here a little bit before, and you know, depending on yields and a lot of other things, of course, if you take, say, a three-year stand of alfalfa, it consumes about 1,000 pounds worth of potash. You know, give or take, you could probably add 250 onto that if it was a really good really good three years. But you think about that, that's a huge number. So if you haven't been spreading potash along the way, uh, you might be at a pretty good deficit going back to your corn crop. So making sure you account for that and getting a good rate out in front of your corn will become really important. Yeah, absolutely. And then usually, Brian, the, the biggest question we get corn following sod acres is what do we need to do for nitrogen? And obviously that's a moving target depending on what that alfalfa stand looked like, the age of the stand and other things. But I think it'd be important that we discuss some of those factors of how do we arrive at how much nitrogen credit to give that alfalfa crop going into corn? Yeah, so there's some pretty big factors there. Factors there you first have to look at. You know, so first things first, uh, soil type. So on sandy loams or sands, you tend to get less nitrogen credit than you would on you know most of the heavier textured soils that we deal with. Um, the next thing is, and I think one that can be overlooked sometimes, you know, what percentage of the stand is alfalfa? If it's just all grass sod. You're not really going to get any nitrogen coming back from that field. So alfalfa, the actual alfalfa portion is where we get the nitrogen credits from. And then the last piece of that is how tall was the alfalfa when it was killed or turned in, you know, basically turned in uh, tillage, whatever it may be. If it's less than eight inches, we have a, a rate we tend to float towards more. But if it did have a lot of regrowth on it, if it was full stage, you would get a little bit bigger nitrogen credit that way too. Yeah, and looking at how that ranges, and again, I do have some growers, Ryan, that may only look at having an alfalfa stand for, for two years after the seeding where maybe that stand is really good. But if you compare a good stand, which is basically, you know, 70 to 100% alfalfa, more than four plants per square foot, you know, if you let that grow higher than eight inches, there can be upwards of 190 pounds of nitrogen uh, credit from that crop. But on the opposite end of the spectrum, if you're at an, a stand that's been three, four years old, the winter kills catching up with it, it's pretty thin. You may be looking at a plant or a plant and a half per square foot. If And if it's less than eight inches, you can have as little as 90 pounds of nitrogen credit. So we're talking, depending on the health of that stand, 100 pounds variation in the credit. Right. Then if it was on a sandy soil type, you could almost cut those in half on top of that. Or you know what I mean? So there's quite a bit of variation. Um, in general, I like to think most of our stands are kind of average when we take them out or slightly below. That's why we're taking them out and switching them back to corn. And most, I think, are less than eight inches of regrowth because we try to get that last cutting off in the fall uh, since we know we're probably going to rotate out. So in those situations, Josh, that 90 to 120 pounds, I think, is a pretty fair place to be. Um, so you start thinking about that in terms of fertilizer. What would you put out for, say, a urea mix or urea AMS mix? Yeah, in most cases, once I address the P and K, in a lot of cases, the growers maybe address the P and K the fall going into corn and it's addressed. But from there, you know, my simple mix for corn on sod, which in most cases my stands were entering that poor category, I'd run 100 pounds of urea, which is going to give me 46 pounds of nitrogen, and 100 to 125 pounds of ammonium sulfate, give me an extra 20 to 25 pounds of N, get my sulfur taken care of. And in most cases, that's going to put you in a pretty good position for your corn following sod acres. Yeah, so you're right around that 70 usable units of nitrogen. You add that on to 100, you know, you're right in that 170 area. And I think a good call out there is we did talk about that high end. If you have that super good stand, it's maybe only been two years and you need to rotate out. Uh, even if you have the really big nitrogen credit there, we still need the AMS or the sulfur out. Uh, so no matter how good a stand it was, you still need to do a, or you do need to apply that sulfur to make sure we have uh, that nutrient taken care of also, which in general, if you're using AMS, will bring a little nitrogen with too. Absolutely. So looking at the final part of that question, Brian, or what we should use for traits, and I think that's a really good question. And kind of looking at it from one standpoint, you know, Brian, we do look at a lot of rootworm situations, but in most cases, corn following three, four years of sod, uh, the rootworm concern is usually not there. Right. So, you know, if you look at rootworm, most rootworm that we deal with is in a corn-on-corn -corn situation. The, the western corn rootworm is the one we fight the most in that area. Um, there is also, you know, the northern corn rootworm that's corn-on-corn. -corn. We find it, we find it a little bit in the corn-on-bean rotation. But in corn-on-sod, uh, you know, we haven't, that crop hasn't seen corn in general for three, five, or, you know, three, four, five years. 
Uh, so we really don't have rootworm as an issue uh, when it comes to corn on sod production. So when you think about traits, you know, whatever you want for a herbicide trait, plus I think the BT trait for corn borer is still a really good one to keep in the mix also. Yeah, I would agree with that all the way. And, and certainly, you know, depending on the field and conditions, you know, in most cases, the seed treatment is going to pick up those secondary pests, which can be a little bit more common to find in corn following sod, such as wireworm specifically. But I think the seed treatment in, in today's realm does a good job of picking up those secondaries. And uh, yeah, I like the corn board trait too. I like having the roundup option there, knowing that we, we, we're going to be dealing with quack grass, probably more corn following sod than any other crop. And if you do a burn down, just to make sure you get it. Um, but yeah, I guess my desired trait package is, is roundup with the corn board BT. Yep. Couldn't agree more. Well, anything else, Brian, you want to cover with that before we kind of roll into the closing here? I, I think one final thing I'd add when you're corn on sod, you know, you do have less corn residue from past years. So in general, the disease pressure is less, but some of those diseases still can blow in. So if you are out scouting, don't just assume you won't have any disease there, you know, still scout for them just like every other farm, but you should have less occurrence in those fields. All right, Brian. Well, uh, always important to know where to find our podcast. Yeah. So you can find it on Twitter. I'm at Farmer Buck One. And I am at Josh Schaffner. Uh, YouTube, you can find it if you put in uh, keyword, our names, followed by Pioneer. Yeah, and the last place you can find it, which is kind of becoming the most common place, is going to uh, pioneer.com and uh, looking at looking for our podcast there. And there you can also subscribe to them via iTunes. All right, Josh, that's a wrap for Episode 5 of 2017. The show is recorded from the Agronomy Bunker Studio in Zimbrota, Minnesota. It is produced by Brian Buck and Josh Offer. This is a bi-weekly podcast. Thanks for listening, and be sure to tune in next time. <laughs>